it's a pleasure to speak to you again. Uh, we've all seen the footage of Devon Witherspoon and his ability to hit. And I'm, and I'm loving the fact we've got the jersey in the background there. People have seen the hitting, they've seen the read and react. But can you give us more of a complete review of his game? You know, what made him a top five pick in the NFL draft? Yeah, well, Rob, great to be back on. I'll start with that. Um, love coming on with you. I, You know, he's a guy that really popped on the radar for us. Um, he was a guy that we didn't have a, a huge grade on over the summer. Um, and really, like, right away, I think he might have been our senior bowl player of the week, week one maybe, uh, against Wyoming. It was early. It was really early. Um, and the thing that, that, you know, he was kind of a late bloomer there. And late bloomer, is, he's, a, he's a somewhat local guy for us. He's from Pensacola, Florida, which is about an hour from Mobile here. So we, we really wanted to get him in the game. It would have been a, a, having a kind of a, a hometown type of a kid in the game. But, you know, he was a good, he was a good high school track athlete. Um, I know one of the coaches over at his school, good high school track athlete, good basketball player, uh, but really kind of a lower recruited guy for football. And, and and uh, just kept developing. And what stood out on that initial tape was the play style, man. Like if there's a if there's a DB that plays like a Seahawk, um, that I mean, this is the guy. Um, you know, you can't compare him to Cam Chancellor because they're just way, way different players. But like the physicality Cam brought up to safety, this kid brings it to corner. He plays a lot bigger than he is. He's fearless. Um, I said this during the fall, and I'll say it again. Like. We've got, you know, we have the we we have a system with PFF Ultimate where we can kind of filter the tape based off situation or what have you. And if you if you just went to like his tackling or run support cut up, man, it is fun tape. I mean, and and you know, it's hard to say that about corners. There's not too many corners you would ever say that about, but but he's just an all around really good football player. He he's got good eyes in zone. He he's really athletic in man coverage. He can stick to you. But the thing you keep going back to is just the play style and the temperament. I mean, it's hard to find guys at that position that play like him. And he's, he's really going to fit the Seahawk identity. So to me, you know, when we were going through the process and a lot of people thought Jalen Carter, I, I really never thought that was going to be the guy for them. I thought they were going to really stick to their guns and um, stick with what they say they want to be from a football character standpoint. They did that last year and they nailed the draft. I thought they would do that again. So I never thought Jalen was going to be the guy. And then with the quarterback thing, I, I, I felt, I, you know, with Gino and Drew, I feel like they, they're in a good spot there. Um, I always thought this was kind of the dark horse guy just because he fit them so well. So it was really cool, really cool to see him go there. You mentioned his temperament. and I was watching an interview that he did with Steve Smith Sr., on a podcast before the draft and Steve Smith was asking him what other positions he played in high school and he didn't mention receiver. So Steve Smith goes, did you ever play receiver? And Devin Witherspoon says, I, I kind of saw that as a pretty boy position. Does that kind of speak to his confidence <laughs> and mentality that he was prepared to say that to Steve Smith's face? That's right. No, that again, that's, he's, he's got, he's got a lot of alpha qualities, man. He's, he's, he's wired the right way. Now what's really cool with, I mean, back to back years, now you got Tariq Woolen. Um, Witherspoon, you got Kobe Bryant, who they can either play in the slot or move to free safety. I mean, Kobe can do a lot of different things. So, man, they've they, they've nailed um, they've nailed that secondary these last two drafts, and then even going Trey Brown the draft before that. I mean, they've they've really done a nice job fortifying that secondary just in a really short period of time. Is it quite an exciting thing for a scout when you have a player who's perhaps not firmly on the first round radar? He was a no star recruit. He, he went to JUCO and then obviously Illinois. And then all of a sudden they emerge in their final year versus maybe a five-star recruit who's always expected to be at the top of the draft. Is it quite, quite a cool thing to sort of see that guy progress quite quickly in a short space of time? Uh, yeah. I mean, and there was, there was another one, you know, from our backyard, Ja'Cory and Bennett was a player from Maryland. Same, same track record you just talked about. He was a zero star out of high school, went to Juco and then went to Maryland the past two years. And I think he was like the second pick in the fourth round on day three, uh, went really early in day three. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it's great seeing guys progress. You love seeing development in players. Um, again, when they keep developing as like seniors late in their career, you know, there's even more out there. Um, that's what I, I love about some of these guys when there's like a consistent, there's no plateauing and there's consistent development. Uh, it makes it a lot of fun for sure. It's been revealed thanks to an article that, that John Boyle from the Seahawks put out this week that Seattle had a first round grade on Derek Hall. What is it about him, do you think, that will have led them to grade him that highly? 
Yeah, I, again, I, they didn't tell me they had a first round grade, but I knew I knew from the I knew it senior bowl week that they were really keyed in on on Derek Hall just from some of the conversations I had with those guys. Um, and I always, I always keep that to myself. You know, I, I, I want the Hawks to be great. I would never, never share anything. Uh, again, he's a guy that fits. He's a guy that fits like who they want to be stylistically. And that's, he, he's a rugged, tough, violent football player. Um, you know, he's, he's a heavy handed edge setter, um, physical, physical beat you up with his hands. And then as a rusher, like there's not a lot of finesse to his rush game. I mean, this guy's going to come straight through you. Um, and the thing is, he when he does clear the corner, when he does run through you, man, he can really run. When he opens it up, I mean, some of the chase stuff, whether it's backside chase or when he clears a corner and he's and he's chasing the quarterback, like he can really go. So um, yeah, it, I, I really like the player. Now they've got they've got four edge guys that that can really bring it. And a couple guys like Tariq Smith, we don't know yet, who I think who has a chance to be a good player. And, and a guy I've been saying for a couple of years, I'd love to see Elton Robinson get more opportunities because I feel like when he does get opportunities, he produces. So really, really good young mix. Um, and again, Derek just fits who they want to be because he was the alpha in that Auburn program. Um, you know, their theory, you can't have enough alphas, man. I mean, this guy, he controlled the locker room at Auburn. Uh, that was a that was a tough situation at Auburn this year. You know, I don't know if you followed it too closely, but they fired their head coach during the season. And sometimes when that happened, teams can kind of fray and fall apart a little bit. And Derek kept that thing close, uh, kept those players together. And uh, yeah, he's going to bring a really a really cool edge to that football team. Those, those first those first couple pit. I mean, between those first two defensive players, Weatherspoon and Hall. I mean, that they they are totally have Seahawk DNA. The first thing that John Schneider said to him when he made the call to Derek Hall was you're going to have to bring that truck up to Seattle. Uh, did you know that he was bringing that, that big thing to Mobile for the, for the senior ball? I did not And he pulled up in that thing. Now he's, he's a local guy too. He's in the opposite direction of Mobile. So Weatherspoon's an hour to our East. Derek's about 50 minutes to our West in the, in the Gulf coast of Mississippi. Uh, he comes rolling up in that big tank and it wouldn't fit in the parking structure at the hotel. So he had to park that thing on the street. I mean, there's thousands. I mean, it's this this place is a zoo. Senior Bowl week. There's a million people here, uh, but his jacked up truck was out on the street all week, and that's why John. I think that's why John brought it up because he called me a couple hours before day two started, um, and we and just to talk about Derek and ask some last minute questions about Derek. And I told him like, "Have you seen the truck this dude rolled up in the mobile in?" And he was like, no, I'm like, I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you a picture of it or shoot you a video of it. And uh, and I think that's probably why he referenced it on the call, because I sent that to him right before the draft. And he's a great athlete, isn't he? You know, it's, it's quite easy to sort of look at his playing style and forget that. I was looking at Dane Brugler's uh, draft guide and he was one five five ten yard split, Jim, you know, four two oh short. He's got the long arms. You've mentioned the character as well. And in terms of an athlete and the mental picture, that's. It's pretty much ideal, I would imagine, for that kind of position. Yeah, it, when you know when they rush the passer like Derek can, um, you don't want him going in reverse too much. You don't want him dropping all too much. Uh, but you know, in terms of an athlete, um, you know, being at the pro day with Aaron Heinlein, who's their director of college scouting, Aaron, Aaron does an awesome job for for the Seahawks, and and he basically has the southeast part of the country now. Uh, down here he's down here a ton I know he goes everywhere else too but he's Aaron seems like he's down here a bunch that that pro day workout that, that Derek went through was impressive man they worked him through the d-line workout first then they put him through a full linebacker workout and he was ready to go like there were there was guys dropping out some of the d-linemen were dropping out at the end of that one some of the linebackers were dropping out at the end of that one they worked those guys hard that day he went through both of them and he was ready for more I mean this dude so um, yes, athletically to answer your question, watching him drop that day and do some of the coverage stuff in the linebacker drills easily has the movement to do it. But again, when you rush like he does, man, just let him go get the quarterback. But if they if they have to drop him, he can certainly do that. I'm limited only to the clips that I can find on YouTube, Jim. But I thought that Cameron Young was one of the unsung heroes for the Senior Bowl. You know, a little bit like Abe Lucas a year earlier. What can you tell us about him? See, it was obviously needed interior D line help. And by the sounds of things, they're going to be relying a lot on him this year. Rob, that's a great point. Um, I thought that that Abe Lucas really, from senior bowl point on, because I thought he had a great week. Um, 
I thought I didn't think enough people were talking about Abe Lucas into the lead up of last year's draft at all. So when Seattle took him, I was like, okay, someone was someone was paying attention down here. Um, and Cam, Cam's the same way. Um, you know, this wasn't a really deep interior defensive line class. So, I mean, I almost feel like Seattle rolled the dice um, and and waited to take him there. But he was there, and that's when when you have a good draft. Sometimes it has to fall your way, and that. That one certainly fell their way. Oluwatimi certainly fell their way. Um, but yeah, Cam Young is, is uh, you know, a, a, a big human being, really long. I mean, going back to last year when we got the measurables um, from the junior uh, uh, combine stuff, when the scouts went out last spring and his arms came back 35 and 6 eighths or something. I mean, this guy's incredibly long for, a, for an interior guy and just big and stout and uh, again, plays plays how they want to play, and they were a little thin there. That was certainly a need. I think that's why a lot of people thought Jalen Carter. Uh, but to get Cam Young where they got him, again, SEC football players played big boy football his whole career. Um, he'll be ready to go. I mean, you, if, if there's if, if, at that position, if you're going to find guys that are going to make that transition from college football to pro football, you're really only going to find him in the SEC. So he'll uh, they'll get good snaps out of Cam this year for sure. And you mentioned Olu Oluwatimi, you know, Mr. Consistency at Michigan. As a Michigan man, I'm sure you know all about him. You know, what did we see from him in, in Mobile as well? Is he capable of winning a starting job as a rookie, do you think? I do. I do. And you wouldn't say that about, about most fifth-round picks. And I'll say this. So we had like a, a fourth, fifth-round grade on, on Olu um, here at the Senior Bowl. And there's always a handful of guys every year that show up down here. And they're just better than I, I gave them credit for on tape. They just show up better. They're, they're more powerful. They're whatever position, powerful, faster. They're just something about some guys where they leave. I'm like, yeah, man, I, I didn't give that guy enough credit. Olu was one of those guys this, this year. I really thought he had a chance to go on day two. I thought third round was, was kind of the spot for him. So, so again, I don't know what happened in the process. Um, what would make him go in the, in the fifth round, but um, they had a center need. I thought it might've been John Michael Schmitz there in the second round. It's a guy they might've circled. Um, and they took Charbonnet. That was the one kind of upset for me in the, in the draft and them taking the back there. Uh, but, uh, but no, Olu can step in and play, man. He's played a ton of football, at the college level, smart off the charts, you know, not that Gino needs a ton of help at center, but I mean, it's always good when you have a guy that can, that can command things up front and, uh, you know, just look at his background. He went from the Air Force Academy to the University of Virginia, to the University of Michigan. I mean, this guy's, this guy's mature. He's squared away. He's tough. He's strong. He's thick. Um, yeah, I think he's got a real chance to start next year. And then Kenny McIntosh, how on earth did he last to round seven, Jim? We were actually doing a live stream <laughs> when, when he was taken, and there may have been some celebrating going on when he was taken in the seventh round. I mean, that, that to me no is clue. incredible that he lasted that long. No clue, Rob. I'm still trying to figure that one out, man. That one, that one makes no sense to me. Um, all I can say is that teams put, put too much stock into the testing. Um, and I, I shared this with John. I mean, I started, I started texting people around the league, not just the Seahawks, but just buddies around the league in like the fifth and sixth round. Like how in the heck is McIntosh still available? Like, what am I, what, what did we miss? Right? Like I'm always trying to figure out like, cause if he didn't get drafted, we want to, we want all our guys to get drafted. So if he didn't get drafted, I mean, to me, that's technically a miss for us. So I'm trying to you know, like figure this out on the fly as we're going um, and I told John that, that uh, for whatever it's worth, man, I'm like, we had to, we had a higher grade on McIntosh than we had on Charbonnet. Kenny McIntosh was our highest grade running back. Charbonnet was our second highest grade running back for the game this year. And, and to me, you always use like the combine and pro day and testing numbers to check yourself, right? As a scout, you want to go back to the tape. Now, did that show up? Did I miss that? Um, you know, he ran low four sixes, whatever that might be. Um, you know, in the pro day, some of the shuttles weren't great. But man, we went back and watched more Kenny McIntosh after the workout stuff. And he's an explosive football player and he's dynamic. Um, you dig into some of the analytical stuff and uh, like what he was able to do in the pass game and the run game, both the versatility, um, true, true position versatility. All you got to do is Google highlights and you'll see that, I mean, they'll spread him out wide. They'll put him in the slot. Um, they'll do some gadget stuff with him. He's, he's a weapon with the ball in his hand. So, Again, I know they love Charbonnet. We love him too. I mean, I think Zach really fits what they want to be stylistically. Again, he, he's a Seahawk, um, hard downhill running guy, decept really good vision, deceptive, slipperiness. 
but uh, but man, to get Kenny McIntosh in the seventh, I, I I said it online. I thought that was the best value pick of the entire draft, and not not just because he's a Seahawk and he went went to went to the Hawks, man. But to get that guy in terms of like where we had guys graded on our board to where they got picked, um, there was no bigger discrepancy on our in our our grading stuff than than Kenny McIntosh going in seven. So now they got three really good young backs that. Uh, you know, they're not going to – no knock on some of the some of the depth level backs they had last year like DJ Dallas and Homer and those guys. But but to me, Kenny McIntosh and, and, and Charbonnet are significant upgrades to what they were playing with in some of those games last year. Have you had a chance to – before the draft to, to look at any of the underclassmen that Seattle drafted, a Jackson Smith and Jigba, for example? Have you had a chance to look at them? Yeah, I went back and we looked at all the top wide, wide outs. Um I thought Jackson Smith and Jigba was the best one. If I had that pick, that would have been that would have been my pick. Again, I like not a dynamic. I wouldn't describe him as like a dynamic or explosive player, but just a really classy, polished, skilled football player. Really skilled catcher of the football. Um, you know, some of the some of the off target catch stuff, whether it be like below the waist level, um, that can be really hard to snatch or. Uh, some of the older, the shoulder stuff that, that, I mean, just his natural hand placement, there was a couple catches in that Rose bowl game a couple years ago that uh, just really cool catcher of the football and uh, knows how to get open. And Seattle hasn't had a guy like this since, since probably Doug. Now Doug was more of an explosive athlete. I mean, twitchier off the line, more explosive at the break point, but this guy's just got a lot of subtle nuance and uh, reading coverage and stemming routes. And he, he's going to get open. He's played at a high level at Ohio State, and to me, he's got like security blanket written all over him early in his career. Sometimes it takes a long, takes a couple of years for these young wide receivers to kind of gel and, and gain the trust of a quarterback. And I, I don't see that being an issue with with Jackson Smith and Jigba. I think that he'll get on the same page with Geno quickly and and kind of be a nice bailout guy in the middle of the field um, at the receiver spot. Which again, I I don't feel like they've had a really dependable, consistent guy in that role since Doug. When a draft's finished, do you take a, a moment to just sort of consider, you know, the impact that the senior bowls had, Jim, propelling players into a position where they can bolster their stock? Because we've seen it again this year, haven't we? You know, players that were highlighted, that you've highlighted during the season, they've then come to Mobile, had a great week, and you can just sort of see that tangible impact in their draft stock. Um, I certainly don't take it for granted, man. I really appreciate it. This, is, this has been... Uh a really rewarding job in a lot of, in a lot of ways. It was hard to step away from Seattle and, and, and John and the group there and Pete. I mean, that was an awesome place to work, incredible culture. Um, but yeah, they, I feel like in some ways I can make more of an impact on, on these guys and our game can make an impact on, on these players. So it is, it's always great. I just saw something before we popped down here to do this podcast, uh, Michael Wilson, the receiver from Stanford who went in the third round to, uh, to the Arizona Cardinals uh, must have said something to a, in, in an interview out in Arizona that if he wouldn't have got a senior bowl invite, he would have went back for a sixth year at Stanford. And to me, like, my gosh, like that, that means so much that players would value this stage as much as they do. And, and, uh, and I, I wasn't shy about my, my love for Michael Wilson, man. If I, I would have loved, if I was a GM, I would have loved for that guy to be on my football team. So I, I hope Michael can stay healthy and, and be the player that I know he can be, but, but no, man, it's, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. It is, it's, it's very rewarding. I'm just, the draft is so much fun now. Um, not working for a team. It's hard in some ways because you want, I really enjoyed being, being associated with a team, but, but man, draft day is rewarding because you're seeing all these guys just realize their dreams and, and uh, you know, the hard work and the sacrifice that goes into it and, and really where some of these guys come from and their family situations and now what they're going to be able to provide. Uh, it's just a really, it's a really cool weekend, man. It's a lot. It's just a lot of fun. A bit of a random question, this Jim, but I wanted to ask you anyway. How do you feel about the because the draft gets a lot of attention? There's an increase in speculation. What's going to happen, especially those final two or three weeks leading into the draft? And I just wonder whether that's sort of a negative thing that's been coming into the draft. I think the the fact that C.J. Stroud was so emotional, for example, when he was selected, I think that's because he'd basically been through a roller coaster for the last month leading up to the draft. Do we need to be wary of, of what's happening here, that there's so much speculation now about this player's falling, this player's rising, and then players end up getting disappointed, they end up being surprised by how early they go, and it's just such a rumour mill leading up to the draft now. Yeah, 
Rob, that's a really good point, man. And I, I don't want to go off on a tangent or anything, but it's a little topical right now. And I've, I've said some, I've posted some stuff on Twitter about it. Um, and I'm not trying to get after anyone in particular, but like the whole way too early mock draft thing. And I, I understand why, why media outlets want it because again, it's very consumable. Right. Um, and all this stuff is good for conversation. It feeds the draft monster and everything. And we're a part of that draft. So I, I get it. I appreciate it, but I just wish there was a way for, for players not to see it and not just the players, their families as well, or agents, because even as much as I've, cause I've heard this a lot from players and maybe that's why I'm sensitive to it. Cause I've talked to players about this. Um, they try to ignore it, but then that, you know, they have family members and agents and everyone telling, well, Hey, we've got you in the first round. And I was just talking with someone at one of the big agencies today and they did a study it's on my desk right now. I had him send it to me and it's, uh, he compiled all the way too early mock first round drafts from last year. And on the average, there was like, I, th- I want to say it was seven to nine guys um, in each of those that, that either went undrafted or stayed in school or transferred. So like, that's basically almost a quarter to a third of these mock first round drafts where they, they not only did they not go in the first round they didn't get drafted or they didn't feel like they were good enough to come out in this year's draft so there's just some danger there and, and again like you said like the cj strata i mean like the media call with kenny mcintosh who you were probably on the on the line with right and and again that wasn't the media's doing because that i mean that just was part of the draft process and the testing and kenny fell but i mean that's how passionate these players are and so there is there's some letdown we saw with will levis um to me that was heartbreaking that was hard to watch um, when there's always there's seems like there's a guy like that every year we're all sitting around watching him in the green room so so yeah man I don't, I don't know how you dial it back I don't know what you do I know every time I go out and speak to a group of players at a school I tell them please fellas like ignore ignore all the stuff that's out there about you um, because really it's for entertainment it's for for the fans and it's great for the fans and, the, and everything but it's for the for the players man the best you best thing you can do is just avoid it Final thing I wanted to ask you about, and I know that it's, it's looking ahead ever so slightly, and I don't want to put you on the spot too much because I know you've got a lot of work to do before the season begins. But um, I'm already watching the 2024 quarterbacks. You put a tweet out saying there's a, a the, sort of the watch list, and it was huge, Jim. So because so many players didn't declare for the 2023 draft and have come back, just how thick does that, that sort of that QB group look this year compared to previous years? And have you got any early thoughts on, on maybe the quality of, of the depth there as well? Yeah, we just uh, been watching. I think we've got through four or five guys today. Um, we're watching three games and we're just rolling through three games to get a feel for some of these guys. It is a long list. And again, some of these guys, I, I said to the guys upstairs, our scouting assistants before we were watching, I said, guys, like, we're going to watch these guys to get a little bit of feel, but it, it doesn't really matter. Like we need to see this guy. We need to see Sam Hartman you know, who'd been at Wake Forest. We need to see him in more of a conventional offense at Notre Dame. We need to see Brennan Armstrong, who a year ago, we really liked the Virginia tape. And then a new coaching staff came in and a lot of things can happen. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but, you know, Brennan didn't play at the level I'm sure he expected. So now he's at NC State. We need to see him at NC State. So there's a lot of guys that have played a lot of good football at the college level that are either in new places or, um, you know, came to like Bo Nix at Oregon is the guy we invited to last year's game. And now he's back at Oregon. Yeah, there's a lot. You know, we watched Jaden Daniels yesterday from LSU. That was some pretty good tape. Um, better than I expected. I was I thought Jaden played really well once he got settled in. I saw him play early against Florida State live and then middle of the season against Ole Miss live. Um, and I watched some late stuff. Man, he got better and better and better. So um, it's going to be a big class. It's going to take a lot of work. Uh, I can't wait to get to like the Manning camp this summer and see some of these guys throw together as a group, but uh, it should be fun. It's, it's, I mean, that's a good problem to have. A lot of quarterbacks is a good problem to have. So uh, it should be fun. Jim, it's always a pleasure. I'm already looking forward to those tweets during the season, singling players out so we can keep track of them and, and to the senior bowl again next year. I'm sure it'll come around very quickly. Uh, Rob, thanks for having Yeah, we're going to really start in the next couple of days. We're going to start posting every single day. I'm going to try to post two prospects a day that we watched that day just to uh, give some content throughout the summer, man. But uh, uh, yeah, enjoy the schedule release and all the games heading over there to uh, over to your neck of the woods, man. And uh, have a great summer. And we'll hopefully we'll connect next fall.